Okay, great. So the, our next uh, guest lecture is by uh, Bram van der Borg from Free University of Brussels, and he's going to talk about the uh, novel actua actuation principles on series parallel actuation in self-healing materials, and I heard that you actually have a, an ERC grant on exactly that topic. Yes. Is that right? Okay, yes. thanks, Bram. So we're looking forward to your talk. Okay, thank you. So during, thanks for inviting me, and I will talk about two new innovations that we're working on in the ERC grant. The first one is on series parallel elastic actuators, and the second one is very, very novel on self-healing actuators. So I will start my talk uh, from the traditional stiff actuators, then I will talk briefly about our work in a research group about variable stiffness actuators or compliant actuators, and then I will go over parallel elastic activation to series parallel elastic activation, and then that we try to introduce innovative materials in these actuators, which are materials with self-healing properties. So for stiff act so uh, stiff actuation is widely used in robotics. Uh, so they cannot be heard from the equilibrium uh, position. And um, they're suitable for static and known environments like in industry, uh, but they're unsuitable for dynamic and unknown environments and often including humans. And there are a number of disadvantages of stiff actuations, although they're very good for precise trajectory control. Uh, they, uh, the next slide, uh, they have no energy storage capabilities. So that's often the reason why those running and walking bipeds often run out of power very fast. Because like a human, we can store energy and release it in our muscle tendon system. But this is not the case for stiff activation. They can also not absorb shocks. So during my work in uh, Tsukuba in ICE, we uh, stepped over uh, large obstacles by HRP2, but we had to control the landing of the foot in order to reduce the shocks, uh, because that could damage the harmonic drives. And also safety is an issue. So often industrial robots are kept away from humans uh, because they're far and safe while the idea for the future is that humans and robots will collaborate. That's why uh, we went to, uh, as a research community, to investigate series elastic activation or variable stiffness uh, activation. And that can be done in two uh, approaches, both on an active way and on a passive way. So in an active way, uh, the compliance is generated by software and by measuring the torques in all the joints, like, for example, on this very impressive Coca uh, lightweight arm, which is a spin-off from uh, DLR. So you can see that by software you can control the, both the stiffness and the damping very precisely and that you can change it very quickly. But as a limitation, the bandwidth is limited. So if you knock with the hammer on this, you will feel the hardware stiffness and not the software stiffness. It can also not uh, store energy. While if you have a passive element like a spring or uh, in the video, which was my PhD work on the bipedal walking robot uh, Lucy, then there is using a pneumatic muscle, and there you have the air compressibility. So there you have unlimited bandwidth to impact, and you have the passive compliance so you can store energy uh, in the spring uh, element. <laughs> so uh, here you see a, a compliant uh, robot, and on the internet you will see videos of also where you can see it uh, walking. What we uh, did with the compliant activation is first uh, we investigated uh, safety. Um, so uh, due to the decoupling of the inertias of the different links, uh, this enhances the, the safety. Uh, as you see on the left corner, you see one of our uh, manipulated arms with the pneumatic muscles, and this was to investigate uh, safety in human-robot uh, interaction. One of the things we found that uh, uh, compliance is not sufficient to guarantee uh, safety. The reason is that you can store quite a lot of energy in those uh, spring elements, and if you not control it properly, this can behave very uh, violently which we want, for example, in hopping robots and in prosthesis, as you will see in the next slide, 
bridge, which is, of course, sometimes not uh, required, like in manipulated arms. So I think for safety, you need both in the hardware uh, compliant elements and in the software also to incorporate it. So we developed uh, and implemented, uh, for example, the proxy-based sliding mode controller, which I will not go into details, but we use this proxy-based sliding mode controller also in our step rehabilitation robots, which is Altaco, which you see on the top uh, right uh, corner, which is the full lower limb uh, exoskeleton where both the ankle, the knee, and the hip is uh, activated by our Makepa variable stiffness actuators, and also the hip can be moved from the left and the right for stability. Uh, on the right bottom, you see our assistive exoskeleton, which is developed together with the Kai Leven, uh, which has also all Makepa actuators. There, the idea is for using it with persons with um, muscle weakness, for example, elderly who have difficulties with standing up uh, from a chair. And on the left top, you see our uh, social robot Probo for also not only physical human robot interaction but also cognitive human robot interaction and it has 20 motors in the head to show different facial expressions because we want that the children are able to hug and physically interact also with the robot we uh, implemented uh, compliant elements compliant activators so the robot is also very soft and huggable and currently psychologists are using this robot to investigate uh, robot-assisted therapy with uh, autistic children. So all those, uh, in all those applications, we used uh, compliant activators for safety. We also did it for uh, uh, energy storage in the next uh, slide, where uh, we developed, for example, prosthesis to uh, an ankle that uh, requires 120 Newton meter and 250 watt motor which is when you do it with a stiff activation, you need a motor of a few kilograms uh, to activate that, and then the prosthesis will weigh so much uh, that the rest of the body needs to consume so much energy to move that leg to the back and the front. So it's very important that uh, the prosthesis is as light as possible. So in this prosthesis, we implemented an innovation that we store energy in a spring, uh, and that we release it at the heel off phase. So during a very long time, we store element energy in a spring element, which is locked. And at heel off phase, we unlock that energy and all that energy is injected in the ankle. So you can compare it a bit when you need to throw an arrow instead of throwing it with the high force and power. Uh, you can also use a bow where you gradually store energy in that bow and then you release that and all that energy goes in the arrow. So the same principle is done here. And this is now a prototype which we want to develop in a, to a commercial uh, product. And on the right, you see the Cyberlex project. It's a knee ankle uh, prosthesis where energy can be transferred from the knee to the ankle to stimulate a bit uh, the articular uh, muscles. But one of the big problems still in uh, compliant actuators is that they cannot deliver uh, motors which can really uh, mimic the properties of uh, a human muscle, both in torque and in efficiency. So that is a problem, for example, still for exoskeletons, prosthesis, humanoids, uh, and so on. And I think uh, one of the big problems in it is that all the torque still goes through the motor. So if you have uh, an uh, stiff, uh, uh, motor, then you see all the force from the output goes to your motor. Then you have a compliant element, a series elastic actuator. You can exchange energy from the environment in the spring and back, so the power of the motor can be reduced, but the force or the torque requirements for the motor still remain the same because all the force goes through the spring, through the motor, and then to the so it's also with variable stiffness uh, actuators, all the force still has to be delivered by your motor. So for example, if the, uh, your robot has to maintain a certain position, assume that it's not moving, then the mechanical power is zero because there is no speed, but there is still torque. So that means that the electrical power at that moment is not uh, zero, 
Well, the mechanical power is zero, so that means that energy efficiency is uh, zero. Moreover, the size of the electric motor and the gearbox is proportional to the required torque. And a compliant actuator will not reduce that required torque. So you still need heavy electric motors. Moreover, the copper losses in the electric motor are proportional to the second order of the current. And the second order of the current means the second order of the torque. So that means for high torques, you have huge copper losses. And all those copper losses are waste of uh, energy. So um, the compliant actuators are able to reduce the power requirements of the motor, but not the torque requirements. So I, I think actuators are not yet able to work very energy efficient. And we are investigating this. And we think that robots work at about 1 or 10% energy efficiency, so very, very low. The reason is. The maximum energy efficiency of an electric motor is very high, 80%, 90%, but it is only at one-seventh of the stall torque. While motors are in the robots work at varying loads and speeds, so that means you use the complete workspace of the motor. So often you use the motor in very low energy efficient uh, regions. The so electric motors don't provide enough torque, so different applications are still difficult. So I think the challenge is to improve the torque mass ratio and improve the energy efficiency. And then there is an interesting uh, observation. It shows that the biological muscle has in fact a specific power density which is 10 times lower than from an electric motor. And also the maximum efficiency of a biological muscle is four times lower than the maximum efficiency of an electric motor. So I think that the electric motor, in fact, is not a problem. I think the way the transmission from the output shaft, from the motor towards the, uh, the link, that there we need to have drastic improvements. And that's exactly what on which I want to work in the uh, ERC event. And one of the possibilities to reduce the torque on the motor is to use parallel uh, elastic uh, activation. And a famous example is, in fact, such a desktop lamp. So there is no activation. You have only joints, passive joints. And in parallel, there are the springs, uh, which you see here on the, on the feature. So the springs are in such a configuration that in whatever position you place that lamp, it will maintain that uh, position. Because the springs are calculated for that specific load. So one of the disadvantages is that if you change the load, then the system doesn't work uh, anymore. We use, for example, that mechanism in, for example, a knee exoskeleton with pneumatic muscle that you see on the right. We wanted to cancel the mass of that exoskeleton by such a gravity compensation mechanism. But of course, again, if you change the weight of that exoskeleton, that system doesn't work anymore. Also, you heard use the parallel spring in its prosthesis in order to reduce the load on the joint, on the motor, uh, to do that. And also Metin, for example, he used the pendulum setup. And you see that the blue line is the torque required for a certain trajectory. If you add the green line, then it will take the majority of the torque by the spring. And then the red line is the torque needed to be delivered by the motor. So again, by a parallel spring, the torque on the motor can be reduced. The problem is that the spring is there by design. So you cannot kind of switch it off. So that means if you need another torque profile, then the spring is kind of in the way of your system. So all those examples are, in fact, variations on the yield three elements a model. So you have the motor, which is a contractile element. Different applications use a series element. Some applications also use a parallel element. Uh, and some use a combination uh, of the three. I wanted to go move beyond it. And that I called series parallel elastic uh, activation. So let us recapitulate uh, the problem. So in a stiff activator, in a series elastic activator, and a variable stiffness activator, all the force on the link is felt by the motor. 
So my idea is instead of using one motor and one spring element, why not use a lot of springs in parallel? If you have now a torque or a force on the output link, only a fraction of that total force will be felt by the motor because all the force or the majority of the force will be uh, taken by the parallel springs. And since in those parallel springs you don't see any motor, the, the, the one motor is not loaded by this uh, output force. So what we then need is a kind of magical uh, system, a device, that can make the motor jump from one parallel spring to the other, to bring it in an, from an unpretentioned phase, like the lower fling, springs, pretensioning it, and when it's completely pretensioned, lock it to the ground so that the motor can jump to the next uh, parallel spring. Another possibility is to use different parallel motors in different electric motors in parallel. Every time you use a non backdrivable element so that when you apply current on one of the motors, this in lux, you pre-tension, and as soon as the motor doesn't move, you have a brake that makes that the motor doesn't feel uh, the load at the output. Level. The inspiration, in fact, came from the, uh, our muscle fibers in a biological muscle. So in fact, our muscle doesn't consist of only one serial spring and one parallel spring. No, it consists of a bunch of series and parallel muscle fibers. When we lift something light, like a pencil, we only use a few muscle fibers. When we lift something very heavy, like a table, we use a lot of muscle fibers. And this is called variable uh, recruitment, that our um, uh, system will, re will uh, use a few or more uh, uh, muscle fibers depending uh, on the load. And that is exactly what I wanted uh, to achieve. And we uh, developed a first proof of concept. So you see that one motor, the, it's a servo motor, one by one, uh, three tensions, four springs after each other. So now you see the first spring, the second spring, the third spring, and the fourth spring. And you see that a very heavy weight can be lifted. We can even switch off the power supply, which you can see in the video power off. So we switch off the power, and you see normally the joint will move back to the vertical position, but because the motor doesn't feel the, the output load, uh, because all the parallel springs are locked with the ground, you can maintain that position. So that means that you can lift very heavy lo loads with a very small uh, mode. So how can we, with one motor which has a continuous uh, rotation, generate this intermittent motion that one by one uh, the springs are tensioned? Well, we do that with the Geneva mechanism. So a Geneva mechanism, you see the green disc has a continuous rotation, while the red uh, part has an intermediate uh, rotation. So only when the pin engages, you see the rotation to pre-tension the spring. And in the other phase, there is a locking due to that uh, green uh, and uh, red part, which is locked by that uh, profile. One of the problems of a Geneva mechanism is that you have a nonlinear torque transmission because the radius of that pin between the green and the red part differs. And that's why we use mutilated gears which you see on the right, which is also a certain phase, which is you see now where the, the red part rotates. And then you see the engagement of the green part in it. So then you have the locking uh, phase. So if you then look to the uh, graphs, then you see the black line is the case in which you need a stiff motor to lift a certain weight from the vertical position to the horizontal uh, position. If you would do that with a series elastic actuator, with a lever arm, which you see in yellow, uh, the, level, the yellow part on the right top uh, corner, then you see the blue line 
I see. So you bring, you lift the weight, and you go from a singular position to the other singular position. So the torque goes from zero to a maximum to a, a zero again. So that's visible in the blue curve. And you see that the torque which has to be lifted is about the same torque as the black line. If we do this, however, with the series parallel elastic actuator, then you see the first red hub, which is the torque visible by the motor, and the red uh, dotted line is the simulation, and uh, with the red dots is the experiment. So you see that the experiment and the simulations are very close to each other. So you see that you have the first one where the first spring is tensioned, then the second spring is tensioned, then the third, and then the fourth. And you see that the torque which is felt by the motor is about one-fourth of the total torque which is required uh, at the output. So that means that the torque through the uh, visible or felt by the motor is reduced by the number of parallel springs. Where is then the torque, the remaining torque delivered? Well, this torque is delivered by the parallel springs. And that is the total torque of the parallel springs is given in yellow, so you see that they take the majority of the torque while the uh, torque felt by the motor is seriously uh, reduced. Then we can also see what this gives for the power uh, requirements, so the electricity, electricity, electrical uh, consumption. So which experiments uh, we did here, we have that load, which we move to the vertical position, and then we move around that vertical uh, position. And we did it in three cases, in a stiff version, the black line, the blue line with two parallel springs, and the red line with four uh, parallel springs. So you see that every time the output has exactly the same uh, motion, so the mechanical output is in the three cases exactly the same. However, if you see the electric power, then you see the black line is a stiff one, so you see it uses a lot of uh, electric, electricity, then the blue line is already seriously reduced when you use only two uh, parallel springs, and when you use four parallel springs, you see that the total power consumption is only 11% of the stiff uh, setup, with exactly the same uh, motor. The reason is that to do this motion in a stiff setup, you need to deliver all power to let it move up and down, while in the Series parallel elastic activation, the three parallel springs deliver most of the torque, and one spring has only to make that uh, the, the torque required to do that slight uh, oscillation. So you see that the output power is the torque at the output multiplied by the velocity, which is that equation on the lower part. So the speed is in the three cases the same. But the output torque is split in a torque delivered by the spring and a torque delivered in the torque delivered by the parallel spring and a torque delivered by the motor. So the torque delivered by the motor multiplied by the speed is only what has to be delivered by the electric motor. So as a conclusion of this one, you can see that it shows the feasibility to reduce the torque requirement and also it improved the energy efficiency. Moreover, it kept the compliance, but the points to improve is that you, it's an increased mechanical complexity, which was only a un unidirectional torque. It could only uh, lift the weight, but not put, uh, deliver torque in the opposite direction, and we had no variable uh, stiffness. So then we went to the second uh, concept, which is based on our uh, Makepa principle, which you see here. So you see here that one motor uh, delivers, uh, provides the equilibrium position. So we change that equilibrium, uh, this lever arm, and then this output link tries to align himself with that lever arm. And you see that in all the positions, you have uh, the compliance. Then on the right uh, video, you see that uh, when you pre-tension the motor, you have a very stiff uh, joint, as you see now. When you reduce uh, the pre-tension, 
you have a very compliant uh, joint. So there are two motors, one for the uh, stiffness and one for the uh, equilibrium position. And one of the advantages is that such an actuator can be built with a minimum of off-the-shelf components and that the dimension of the equilibrium motor can be different than the torque uh, motor of the, for the equilibrium position, which we did, for example, for our exoskeletons, for Alteco, for example, where you have a very big motor for the position and a very small motor because you don't need to so quickly change the uh, stiffness of the joint. So what we did with this actuator, instead of using only one spring, we stacked different springs on top of each other, which you see in this slide. So here you see four different springs or four different Makepa actuators stacked on top of each other. So what we need to do again is that we have a motor arm which engages the spring, which you see here, and you see the green tensioner and the red motor arm, and it has a guiding mechanism, and in the guiding mechanism, the motor makes that you can control the equilibrium position of that spring. However, in the outer position of the guide, it is automatically locked, that tensioner, and the motor arm can continue to move. So that means at that moment, the motor doesn't feel that spring force anymore, and it can go to the next uh, level. So what we did, we had four springs on top of each other. We had four lever arms, which were, had a leaf phase of 90 degrees, and one by one we could uh, do the pretension. So if we go to the next slide, then you can see exactly what is happening here. So in the outer position, there is the locking. So that means that you can push on the output link. You see that there is no power supply switched on and that you can uh, deliver that torque and even apply shocks. Now you see in the video that only one motor, which is a servo motor, moves the the equilibrium positions of the different levels from one position to the other position. So that means again that the torque delivered by the output link, as you can see here, we on this uh, position you see a weight on the uh, output link that one by one the equilibrium position of the four parallel springs is moved from the left to the right. So that means during every phase the motor feels only one-fourth of the total torque of this uh, motor. One of the things that during these uh, concepts is that you can reduce the torque by one-fourth, uh, meaning the fourth parallel uh, springs. The problem is, however, that after 360 degrees, since the lever arm is rigidly connected to the motor shaft, that you are in, again in the same position. So that means that the total number of parallel springs in this case can only be four because after four, the lever arm is again in the same position and then it cannot activate that uh, tensioner anymore. So what we need to do, we want to use in fact more parallel springs. The reason is that the total output torque and efficiency reduces by the number of parallel uh, springs. <coughs> so that's why we developed the third concept, which you see in this uh, slide. And you see here eight parallel springs. And on the left, you see a very tiny motor, which is able to deliver only 0.02 Newton meter. So if you want to deliver, to lift this weight of 6.6 .6 kilograms, then you need 22 newton meters about, so you need a gearbox of 1,000, which is, of course, impractical. But we will show that with this uh, ID, you can deliver this. So we needed to have eight parallel springs. So that means we need a new concept in order to uh, activate the different layers of the market. So that you will see in this slide. So what we did, we had a special uh, profile, a CAM profile, which has two phases, a travel phase and an activation phase. So in the travel phase, 
the lever arms moves automatically to the next level, which you see here. And in the activation phase, it stays horizontal, so it can move the tensioner from the one locked position to the other pos locked position and then go again to a travel position to go to the next layer in order to activate the interface. So in this video, you see that the output shaft connected with a very small motor rotates continuously and one by one moves the different uh, level, the different parallel springs from one position to the other position. So you can see here that with this extremely small motor, you can move that very heavy weight from one position uh, to the other. So that's the idea with using parallel springs with, and this variable recruitment. Instead of having one big spring and one big motor, not to use a very small motor and a lot of parallel springs in order to, to reduce the torque on the motor and also to reduce, improve the energy efficiency. Then as the last part uh, of the presentation, I want to discuss uh, self-healing uh, robotics. So uh, in soft robotics, often soft materials are used like uh, rubbers and, and so on, which have very good uh, properties, for example, for safety. So they can work in uh, uh, unknown environments uh, and so on. But one of the problems of those uh, soft robotics is that when they encounter sharp objects, they will have a cut or a scratch. And then, for example, the rubber uh, muscle, uh, rubber pneumatic muscles will not work anymore because you have that cut and you have a leakage of compressed air. Also, when you have, for example, big impact or overload, uh, your pneumatic muscle or your variable stiffness activator can be damaged. So what is usually uh, done in uh, robotics to prevent that is to overdimension our uh, robots so that the robot can handle unexpected big loads uh, and so on. But that also means that this overdimensioning, that the weight of your, mode, of your robot increases, and then again you need heavier motors to activate it, and so on and so on. On the other hand, we as humans and also uh, other animals, when we have a cut or we have a bone fracture or we have a torn muscle, we have a self-healing mechanism. So when we have a wound, this wound can, in many cases, uh, self-heal which is a very interesting property in uh, biology, which we want to incorporate in robotics so that we develop robots which can heal by themselves. <coughs> Self-healing materials are in material sciences a very hot uh, topic. So at the moment you have, uh, for example, roads and when you have a crack, uh, then this crack can have self-heal, for example. Nissan, for example, has also now a car, and you can buy a special coating for the car. So when you have scratches on your car, that only by sunlight, those scratches will uh, disappear. And also, for example, KLM and I think Boeing are working on uh, telefilling materials in their uh, engines for their airplanes. And so our idea is to bring those telefilling materials into uh, robotics. On the slide, you see that there are a number of self-healing materials under development in the material sciences, which have both autonomous behavior uh, and non-autonomous uh, ones. Autonomous ones are, of course, the most interesting ones because if you have a scratch, for example, then you have, again, an autonomous uh, healing. While other ones, uh, like the non-autonomous self-healing materials, they need a stimuli, for example, heat, or light or something, uh, a stimuli in order to start the stellar feeling uh, process. But we, at the moment, we use uh, non autonomous uh, stellar feeling materials and we choose the Deers Alder uh, polymers. <coughs> the reason is we have the required mecha uh, mechanical strength, the mechanical properties, in order to use them in uh, uh, robotics. While for the others, we, don't, we are not yet sure if they have the sufficient uh, mechanical properties. 
One of the other advantages of the DAL's elder bonds is that the number of self-healing cycles are not limited. When you have, for example, little capsules of self-healing materials, when you have a crack, this self-healing material opens, and then the material can self-heal. But that also means that you can only use once those capsules, while, for example, in the dear elders' bonds, we can have a cut, we can self-healing, we can have a cut, again a cut on exactly the same place, heal it, and so on and so on. Moreover, the required heat stimulus is quite limited. It's between 70 and 120 degrees Celsius, which is okay. <coughs> so on the next slide, you see on the right a video of the self-healing uh, uh, capabilities. So you see that there is a cut, and gradually this cut is self-healed. So what's in fact happening? So you have uh, a solid network texture when it's at room temperature. When you heat it up, you increase the mobility of those polymer strings. So you obtain a viscous gel-like structure. And then you can see that the cut is gradually healed. And then at controlled cooling, so this whole cycle of heating and cooling has to be done on a very precise uh, profile then you see that the cut is gradually uh, healed and that the cut is disappeared. <coughs> One of the very interesting properties of the self-healing polymers, and those uh, polymers are developed by the cell, uh, and uh, synthesized by the uh, material science department here at the VB, so we have a very strong collaboration with them in that they synthesize it, they, just, they investigate the material properties and we try to investigate how we can implement them in robotics. So one of the very interesting properties of those ideals alder polymers is that you can change the mechanical properties of them by changing the fur and spacer length. So you see that we can, uh, by the synthesizers, change the length of the polymer chain, and when we make it very short, so at 230, it has a very brittle glassy thermostat. So it's very brittle, so it kind of immediately breaks, so there is no strain at fracture percentage. Well, if we gradually increase this length, we go from a very brittle material to a very elastic elastomer with a strain of 450%. So you see, by changing the length of this polymer change, we can go from brittle materials to elastic material. Moreover, we can even mix, for example, a G400 with a G2000, which means that we can obtain properties, intermediate properties, by mixing different uh, series of this material. So we will use different materials depending on the application. Uh, we will use the same material, but with different in different series. Uh, to obtain different uh, applications. So we developed two concepts. The first one is a mechanical fuse. So the idea is if you have an overload, that we make the, the fuse as the weakest element. So that will break instead of the gearbox or the, of the compliant element. And then we can bring it back in the, uh, and then we can telefield the fuse again automatically. So here you see, uh, how we did it. So here you see a cat drawing, and here you see a picture of it. So you see two parts of it. And then we make here a, a reduction of the diameter of the, the polymer parts. So we know that it will always uh, break at this one. So in this case, we use a brittle uh, version of the polymer, so the G400. So there is no uh, elasticity uh, in it. One of the future the ideas is to make the compliant element of a more elastic version of this uh, polymer. But the problem here is that you have necking, so it's more difficult to do the self-healing. So that's for the next phase in the project. And then what we did, we did it in a universal testing machine. We measured at which force we could break the element. Then we did it in a furnace to do the self-healing uh, process, and then we broke it again, 
we uh, put it again in the furnace, we broke it again, uh, and so on. So you see that uh, the three, we have three samples, and you see that the, the fracture force differs for the three. The reason is that we produce it manually, and it's quite small, because to produce such material is not so uh, straightforward. But you see that, the, the re that there is no weakening of the element, and that it almost can maintain the same uh, fracture force, which is an advantage, because that means that uh, it can maintain the strength even after telephealing. <clears throat> Another concept we developed is for soft uh, pneumatic uh, muscle. And in there, to have this uh, bending function, for example, we, use, uh, we need to use an anisotropic material. So we need, for example, a more elastic one for the, the, the blue part, and for the gray part, we need a less elastic material. But since we have this near alder material, which where we can change the material properties, we can develop a, such an activate. One of the problems of those polymers is that it cannot be molded, which is usually done to produce such pneumatic uh, activated uh, muscles. So it, since it cannot be molded, we had to come up with a different concept. So here you see on this slide that the upper part of the cube is, is done with one series, the 2000 series of the uh, cell feeling material, and the lower part is from a stiffer, a less elastic uh, material. So what we do in order to produce such a pneumatic cell, because first we developed only a pneumatic cell instead of a complete muscle, we started from a cross, from a, we cut it from a sheet of this uh, telephealing material, then we put it in a Teflon uh, mold, and then we use the telephealing properties, so we put it in a furnace, in order that we could produce one part where all the edges are connected. What we did then, that is one material, then we use the other material, the more stiffer material, for the lower part, and then we added uh, the little tube in order to pressurize this cell. Then we could investigate what are the uh, mechanical properties of this cell, and here you see the uh, uh, video of the inflation of this muscle, and we measured forces and also uh, expansions which are similar of uh, pneumatic cells uh, described in literature. So we could obtain similar uh, muscles uh, with this uh, material. What is the advantage of it? We can uh, add a cut in it. So here you see that we made an incision in it. Also, once there was, by an overpressure, a perforation at the side, what we did then, we telefield uh, the pneumatic activator, and we measured again uh, the force and uh, at different overpressures, and you see that the properties of this uh, cell are exactly the same. So that means that these activators are completely rehealed after having a cut or an overload of, uh, of the material. So what's the conclusion? Compliant activators are investigated for safety, energy efficiency, robustness, and explosive motions. But the concurrent, the, the torque mass and the efficiency is not yet reached, which causes problems for different uh, applications. What we did, we made several proof of concepts to show the feasibility for improved torque and efficiency. And this is the primary idea that we are currently further developing in the air sequence which started this February. One of the issues is that, of course, the mechanical complexity of that actuator will increase a lot. Uh, but I think by new manufacturing techniques, like additive manufacturing, we can, in fact, handle this complexity. And I compare it often with a screen. Before, the old TVs were with a, uh, an electric beam that were deviated by magnetic fields. But now with the modern screens, every pixel is controlled by itself. And by very advanced manufacturing techniques, we can make such very complex uh, devices. Also, by making chips, we can place now a lot of billions of transistors on a very small chip. So for the brain, we can 
our brain has about 85 billion neurons, and in a PC we can achieve 2.6 billion transistors now. However, in the body, we have 800 muscles, and I couldn't find in literature, in fact, how many muscle fibers we have, but that must be many order of magnitudes are bigger. However, very advanced and complex robots have only 50 to 70 actuators. So I think we need to, to increase that mechanical complexity in order to have a lot of muscle fibers in a robot in order to have the same versatility, energy efficiency, uh, and so on. And I also presented during this presentation the very preliminary ideas and concepts of self-healing uh, robots. If you're more interested, uh, then you can uh, find more information in our, pres in our uh, publications. And the work I presented was mainly done by Glenn Matthijsen, Raphael Tournemont, and also uh, Sippe Terrain, which are PhD students working under the ERC-20. Thank you very much for your uh, attention, and if you have questions, feel free to ask. Thank you very much. So, are there any questions? Who wants to start first? Hello, Bren. Uh, I'd like to ask you if you know the Baxter robot, the way they yes. use the spring. Yeah, they use uh, series elastic uh, actuators, so the stiffness cannot be changed. And there is exactly uh, implemented for this uh, safety. So one there, one of the disadvantages is that the precision is not so precise. Uh, but one of the advantages is that it's very safe to interact with this robot. Uh, so uh, we're also working on those type of uh, manipulators for uh, industry where you want that the, on a very intuitive and social way you can interact with the robot by, for example, demonstrating what he has to do. But then, of course, means that the robot has to be absolutely safe and that is there achieved with the serious elastic actuator. Uh, but my, my question would be, uh, have you tried that kind of springs, the circular ones? Um, yeah, one of the things is that uh, mostly in our robots we use uh, linear springs, compression of extension springs. Uh, but we're also working on torsional springs, like in, uh, I think, Baxter, but I have not yet looked inside how Baxter looks like. What we uh, do is we want uh, the snow springs are very heavy, so we want to see to new concepts in order to reduce the weight of it. And what we, for example, developed is we, we use material and then with a laser cutter, we uh, develop our own uh, torque, uh, torsional uh, springs. But indeed, we're also, and in the we want to look to composite materials in order to also make less heavy springs. We're also now looking, making our new uh, prototypes for the series parallel elastic activators, also using rubber bands. So we're looking mm -hmm. in different new materials also to replace the metal springs because they are a bit too heavy. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you. Have you ever thought about combining biological materials with um, <coughs> materials to create some, some no, kind of hybrid? Uh, I know that. Sorry. No, we don't use uh, biological materials. But I know that there is research, I don't know the authors by heart, that they use biological materials <coughs> sorry, to be used later also in robotics. But that is not our expertise in this. We only use biology as a field of inspiration, and we try to uh, make a mechanical uh, version of, of it, but not to use biological material. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? One more from Plymouth. About the, the healing, self-healing materials, 
Uh, I saw that you made some uh, cuts in the material, but which which size compared to the total size of the? Uh, yeah, uh, one of the things, of course, is that um, yeah, it's very preliminary, and we need still need to see how big the material is. One of the things is that we uh, we need to see when we have, for example, such a cell, and it will be something like that, that the material doesn't sell a feel in that position, uh, for example. So what we are currently making is models of this material, and to see at different temperature how will be the deformations of the material, uh, in order that when you bring it back together to a cell feeling position, and that has to be done, for example, in that first concept, where it, uh, the material kind of breaks, you need to bring it back to the uh, cell feeling position so that the material can cell feel again. So one of the future developments will be how the how the actuator knows it's broken, and that to, how you need to bring it back to the uh, position that it can cell feel. And one of the reasons now we use stiff material is that there is need deformation of material in that, so you can bring it together. While imagine if it breaks with an elastic material, you have making it because thinner and thinner, and then how you need to bring it back together. So that is still a lot of research needed in order to uh, to make it real realistic. This is really very first concept which needs still a lot of uh, research in order to make it uh, practical. Okay, thank you. Any other questions? Um, if not, let's thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.